Thank, thanks, Milton, for the kind introduction. I think if I am ever feeling down, I'm just going to call Milton and have him introduce me, uh, pick, pick me up. So before I get started, uh, there is one thing I'd like to say. I, over the last couple of years of working with Milton, the VC team, I've developed a great deal of respect for them as an organization, and then the, the culture that they really have, I think, is, is very, very unique. So there is uh, three things that I would like to touch on today. Uh, this is my last slide, not my first one, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> So thank you for having me here. Three things I'd like to touch on today. The first is I'd like to introduce who we are, CEP America is, as an organization, and why we decided to develop our telehealth capabilities. And this really goes to the title, telehealth or blockbuster, or condensed down telehealth or bust. The second thing I'd like to do is talk through some of the telehealth programs that we have developed over the last one to two years. And then thirdly, spend the vast majority of our time talking through some of the key lessons that we have learned on our telehealth journey. So let's kick us off about who CEP America is. Although probably many, if not most of you, have never heard of us as an organization, we are actually one of the nation's leading multi-specialty physician groups, one of healthcare's incumbents with over 40 years of healthcare experience. We have a number of arms to our organization. One of the very important ones is our large provider arm with 2,100 physician partners, 1,300 advanced providers. These are our physician assistants, our nurse practitioners, our CRNAs, and 2,000 scribes, making us one of the larger scribe companies in the country as well. Another arm to our organization is our management service organization that has 300 employees, our billing company that has 1,000 employees, and our own A-rated medical malpractice company. We are a wholly physician-owned, democratic partnership, and we focus on what we call the acute care continuum. So this is the time span in healthcare that we focus on, from three days prior to the need for an acute care encounter to 30 days after discharge from that acute care encounter. So as you can imagine, to focus on that time span, we have to have a number of specialties, and we do our hospital-based specialties, our emergency medicine, hospitalist medicine, critical care, anesthesia, surgery, neurology, and psychiatry. Our non-hospital-based specialties outside of the telehealth space are urgent care and post-acute care. We have the honor of caring for 6.3 million patients per year. That's across 14 states plus the District of Columbia. We have hundreds and hundreds of practice locations, which means that we interface with or partner with virtually all the major national health systems in the country and many of the smaller health systems as well. So that leads to the logical question, why does one of healthcare's most successful incumbents that has four plus decades of experience and generated billions and billions of dollars off of revenue from in-person services develop a telehealth program that potentially cannibalizes our very successful in-person practices. And this is where the title of the talk comes in, telehealth or blockbuster. Much like blockbuster was, we're one of the healthcare incumbents. Blockbuster was one of the incumbents, highly successful, one of the leaders, if not the leader in their space, of selling services to customers who came to their storefronts, came to their locations for those services. That's us. Patients come and see us. Now along comes an insurgent that we'll call Netflix. Now is willing to offer services to customers wherever and whenever they may want those services. No longer has to come to a location or a storefront. So this is one of the reasons that our organization decided to develop our telehealth capabilities is because we don't want a telehealth insurgent coming along, providing the services that we have for the last 40 years to our patients, but instead of them having to come and see us, now they'll give her those services wherever that patient may need them, whenever that patient may need them. So that's the first reason why we developed our telehealth capabilities. Second reason, and even more important reason, is telehealth is the right thing to do for our patients. Oftentimes people come up to me and say, Rick, how do you guys know how to position yourselves for long-term success in healthcare? 
Healthcare is so unpredictable. There's so much chaos and uncertainty. And the answer really is, if you're doing the right things for the patient, and you're putting patient care first, you're gonna be positioned very well for success in healthcare, no matter what path it may meander along its way. Not only is telehealth the right thing for the patients, it's also the right thing for our providers and our partner facilities. Our partner facilities are our hospitals, our urgent cares, our skilled nursing facilities, our surgical centers. It's also the right thing for the payers in our communities, our payers being our health plans, our ACOs, our IPAs, our employers. Speaking of communities, telehealth is the right thing for us to do for our communities as well. All healthcare is local, we know this. A national one-size-fits-all solution is not gonna meet the unique needs of the community. It's not gonna meet the unique needs of that patient population. It's not gonna meet the unique needs of that healthcare ecosystem. So we have found that telehealth allows us to expand the reach of one of our greatest assets, which is our thousands of healthcare providers. We've also found that telehealth allows us to enhance care coordination, break down some of those silos in healthcare rather than build more. And it's also provided us a value-based care delivery mechanism so we can manage relations outside of higher cost venues such as hospitals, urgent cares, emergency departments. So that's a little bit about our organization and why we decided to develop our telehealth capabilities. Next thing I would like to do is speak through a number of the telehealth programs that we have built over the last year to two years. And I use this graphic to do so. And I move from your left to your right walking through this graphic. So the first building that you'll see we come to, this represents our hospital. We have a couple of telehealth programs that we deliver to our hospital. The two main ones are teleneurology and telepsychiatry, and we deliver this service to over 40 different hospitals, ranging from small remote facilities with very limited capability up to robust tertiary centers in an urban setting. As we move to your right, the next setting we get to is our post-acute care facilities. These are our skilled nursing facilities. And we're a rather creative bunch. We call this Telesniff. So in the skilled nursing facilities, when a patient has a change in condition, instead of the, per the nurse picking up the telephone, calling 911, potentially taking that patient unnecessarily back to the emergency department, now they pick up a tablet and have a telehealth visit with one of our physicians. Along the same lines, but a little bit separately, is we're partnering with Harvard University, with VC, and a senior independent living facility to do a research study on the cost savings of telehealth. We know that one of the major bumps against telehealth are people that say that it's additive to the total medical spend rather than substitutive. And so this study really aims to look at, compared to controls, how does telehealth to this senior independent living patient population reduce total health care spend by linking Medicare claims data. So it's very, very early on, but we hope to have some positive outcomes from that study. As we move a little bit further to your right, this is where we get to our emergency concierge program. This is where we work with the, um, the payers in our communities, the health systems in our communities, and we use our emergency medicine physicians who are staffing our telehealth platform to provide their members their patient population, a virtual concierge emergency medicine physician 24-7 to try to manage their needs virtually rather than having those patients have to go to higher cost venues, emergency departments, urgent cares. Now if we move ourselves a little bit further to that icon that says home care, this is where we are launching in two months a program called complex care management. What does this program do? So within our organization, we have a data and analytics company that's able to identify those patients that are at highest risk for adverse outcomes, highest risk for readmission after discharge from an acute care setting. So this complex care program is going to own this patient population for the next 30 days. They're going to make sure they get plugged back in to their primary medical home, make sure that they have their follow-up appointment with their primary care physician, their specialist. Make sure they've gotten their prescriptions filled. Make sure they know how to take those prescriptions. Make sure that they are taking those medications. 
Make sure they understand their aftercare instructions. Make sure they haven't developed any new symptoms. And if they have, that they're being addressed immediately before they get worse. The team that's going to be owning this patient population is an intimate team of a physician, a transitionalist, which is a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, and a care coordinator. One of the tools that this team is going to use is telehealth. Not just delivering telehealth services to the facility that the patient's being discharged from, but also into the patient's home as well. So that's a number of the programs that we are currently offering. Now there's a number that we have in stages of development without a firm launch date. These include things such as tele-EMS, e-palliative care, EICU, telehealth delivery to behavioral health units for acute medical needs. We know that when patients are in the behavioral health unit, if they have a medical need, what happens to them? They have to get shipped out of the behavioral health unit to an emergency department or other acute care setting. So we'll use our emergency medicine physicians to actually take care of the medical needs of those patients while they're in the setting. Let the behavioral health unit focus on the behavioral health needs. So that hopefully gives a good foundation to the programs that we built and that we are currently building so that we can move on to some of the key lessons that we have learned over the last year to two while building these programs. As I was thinking about what lessons to present because there were so many challenges we faced and so many lessons learned along the way. I took a step back and said, you know, what is the attendance, typically, who is the audience at these telehealth conferences such as the ATA or the VC conference? And what, they, what, it, what I found that it is, is there are several large healthcare incumbents, there are several large tech incumbents, and then there are a number of insurgents. And what I was really struck by is, how much we can all learn from each other. The insurgents can teach us incumbents so much how to be creative, how to move fast, how to be speedy, how to be agile, how to look at different market segments. And us incumbents can teach the insurgents so much as well. I mean, it'll be a perfect setup for a great learning is to have an incumbent partner with a number of insurgents. And what we could teach each other is amazing. So I was just thinking about some of these key lessons that we've learned. Some of these may be obvious to one group or the other, depending if you're an incumbent or an insurgent. But I think that they're a great reminder to all of us. So let's review uh, some of the lessons learned. One of the things that we found is that building a successful telehealth practice, a telehealth program, requires the same exact thing as building a successful in-person practice. And that is putting the patient at the center of the program putting the patient's needs first, building the program around what that patient needs, and building a support team around that program. And it's not just one team, it's a team of teams. The composition of this team of teams is what we call the crucial triad. It's a physician team, a business support team, and an operations team. And we have had key lessons learned in all of these teams, so I'm gonna go through each one of them. We'll start with a physician team. A ton of lessons learned here. Anyone who has tried to manage physicians know that we're an interesting bunch, a challenging bunch, a difficult bunch, an impossible bunch, depending what day or even what time of day you happen to catch us. So there's a lot of lessons learned here. I chose three of them. The first is recruiting. We have learned to never, ever, ever underestimate how important it is to recruit the right physicians for your telehealth team. Also, never, never underestimate how long that can take, how difficult that is, and how costly that could be. One other thing that we have learned is telehealth is a new space. We have a bunch of us physicians that are going into the telehealth space from other practices. The vast majority of us are doing it for the right reasons. However, do you due diligence because there are physicians coming into this space that have had some issues in other practices. And our experience is, not universally, but frequently those issues will follow a physician to their next practice. So first lesson learned, the importance of recruiting. Second lesson, the importance of a medical director for each of the telehealth programs. This person is your franchise player. They can not only help with recruiting, but they can also build your quality assurance program, your quality improvement program, your peer review program. They can set the expectations and standards for the physicians that you have on your team, 
and hold them accountable for that. They can participate in real-time service recovery if there may be issues with nursing staff or patient concerns. Second lesson learned, the importance of the medical director. Last physician lesson that I'll present is the importance of training. I'm not saying that as physicians we are slow. However, we take a lot of training, right? And you need that team, that team from your organization or our organization to train that physician. The physician needs to be comfortable with the technology. The physician needs time to practice with patients and staff to re get really good at developing a quick rapport with that patient, being effective and efficient and personable on a video visit. So those are three of the main lessons that we learned on the physician support team. Now let's turn our attention to the business support team. Three lessons learned here. The first is this team has to be composed of individuals with the knowledge, skill, and drive to accomplish a whole bunch of critical tasks that may not be the most glamorous. But if they're not completed, they're going to torpedo your telehealth program. These tasks include legal, contracting, payer relations, recruiting, licensing, credentialing, marketing, business development, scheduling, payroll, benefits. Not the most sexy task in the world, but someone that has to be able to do these and do them effectively and in a timely manner. Second lesson learned on the business support team is you really have to know your competition. And we took this really for granted, quite frankly. Being in the space, the healthcare space, for four decades, we thought we knew our competition. And you know what? We did in our core business space. However, those competitors are not who are currently competing with in the telehealth space. Competitors are completely different. And it's not just the entire telehealth space. Our competitors for teleneurology were different than the competitors for telesniff which are different than the competitors for telepsychiatry, which are different than the competitors for teleurgent care emergency concierge. Really take the time to dig down in. Who are you competing against? What are their differentiators? What are they selling as their differentiators? How are you actually different than they are? How are you going to sell that? How is that going to resonate to the market? What are their price points? What's their business model? How does that resonate with the market? That's the second lesson learned in the business support team. The last lesson, the third lesson, when it comes to the business support team is structuring or closing deals. One of the things that we have found is if there's any way that you can try to, try to get at how big of a money problem is your customer trying to solve with your solution. If you can do this, it helps so much when it comes to pricing. Difficult but important to try to do. Second thing is, it's going to require creativity, and we know this, to close some deals. Quite frankly, we went in when we first started in the telehealth space, and we said, yeah, here's our model, here's our pricing, uh, how we're going to structure this deal. And our customers were like, yeah, I'm not so sure that that's what we had in mind. So being able to get to a win-win situation with the customers to be able to close a deal. And we're getting a lot better at walking away from deals. I think it's just normal when you first start out, you're willing to take deals to get some credibility and some experience that you won't necessarily take in the future. And you have to reach a point that you're going to say, all right, I'm going to start walking away from these type of deals. And we've gotten better at that. Last team of the crucial triad is our operations team. Three key lessons that we have learned here. The first is implementation is so important. This is going to be one of the hardest thing that you do when you launch a telehealth program is the implementation. Maintaining it is much easier. To be able to do this, you need a crucial individual on your team, and that's a rock star program manager or project manager who can put together a project plan, capture the action items, hold internal and external stakeholders accountable for timely completion of their deliverables. Another key individual is that influential stakeholder that you have on your customer's team that can align their stakeholders in their organization and get them pulling in the right direction to get it implemented. So first lesson learned here is implementation is hard. Put all the time and effort into it. It's absolutely worthwhile. Second le lesson learned here, and Milton addressed this a little bit um, earlier today, is healthcare is a slow moving space. It really is. I, I think we're all normal in this room. I don't know why it takes so long to do things. 
What we found, however, is health systems themselves are very slow moving. If you can do things outside of the health system, it can move a lot quicker. Anytime you have to involve IT or information security, there's a lot of red tape to try to go through. So don't be surprised if it takes you longer than what you would expect. Slow, steady pressure will get it done. Last lesson learned on the operations team, and this was a huge one, workflow is king. If the, the, if the workflow, if the technology, if the telehealth does not fit into the workflow for patients, for staff, for the providers, it's not going to be used. And if it's not used, it doesn't deliver any value. And if it doesn't deliver any value, then you're not setting yourself up for a long-term successful telehealth program. The technology needs to fit in with the workflow, not vice versa. So hopefully I've been able to introduce a little bit about who CEP America is, why we invested in developing our telehealth capabilities, some of the programs we built over the last one to two years, and then get into some of the key lessons we've learned along the way. I do have to acknowledge some of my team leaders, some of this crucial triad of team leaders are here today. We couldn't have done it without them. So depending upon the question, I may also look to them to respond to some of the questions that may be out there. I'll open it up for questions. There is a, one of the element is the post-acute care. Mm -hmm. You follow the patient for 30 days, and you are developing telehealth there. Mm -hmm. So normally those visits are not paid by the payers, you know. So how, how you do the finances on that? Is, is the hospital is paying that, or your group is paying for that? So actually, to kick this off, and it was, I think someone addressed it yesterday or as well, is try to find places where you don't necessarily have to go get a contract or find, try to find ways where you can actually start a program that doesn't require new financing. So there's several ways that we have found that we can do this. This first project or program that we're launching, we're actually using TCM codes from Medicare to bill for this. Some of the telehealth portion itself, if you're not in a rurally designated area, you can't use telehealth as that initial encounter. We have some facilities that we're launching where we're gonna use telemedicine as that initial encounter, that face-to-face -face encounter, because they are in rural designated areas. Other places, we actually are just using telehealth as a tool to assist the whole team. And we have that transitionalist, that PA or that nurse practitioner actually doing that first face-to-face -face encounter on the day of discharge from the facility. And then they'll use telehealth after that as part of the global payment for that 30-day period. There are also, we, we have hospitals programs as well. They do put incentive money in contracts for readmissions. And so if we can put in these programs in a cost effective way and we can earn more on the incentive side, or if the hospital wants to put up some money as well to reduce their readmissions, that's another way to potentially finance it. Um, can you, great presentation. Uh, can you talk through the role of the medical director or I mean, what are the role, what is the role and what are the skills you, look, you looked for and so on? Yeah, so um, the medical director, as I said, really has to be the franchise player. They really need to do, not ask their team to do anything they wouldn't do. So we expect that that person is going to be working like a frontline physician would be working on the program so that they fully understand all aspects of the program. That person has to be able to very effectively be able to communicate, has to be very organized, has to be able to get tasks done. Um, has to be very personable. Um, this is really, I think, in my opinion, the first person you should hire for any telehealth program is this rock star medical director. And you're going to have to compensate him appropriately. Anyone who gets a mic first. Yeah. <laughs> so does CEP have their own app for the provider and the patient? Uh, we, we do, um, thanks to Milton and his team. Um, we've actually partnered with them. One of the first things that we did when we looked at developing our telehealth capabilities, we looked at ourselves and said, Self, are you a technology company? And we said, no, we're not a technology company. We're a healthcare company. And so then we did a really comprehensive search to find the right partner, and we have chosen VC. I think we made a wise decision to do that. Um, we do. We have a web-based platform and Android and iOS apps that we use. Yep, whoever's next. That was a nice, that was a very nice talk. Do you see the industry, when you say, when you say know your competitors, 
um, this is something we struggle with a lot is sort of, is there, is the industry moving towards like niche services or more to sort of like a global health system sort of be a do all, a, a sort of an Uber of options for telehealth services? I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so um, I think that our current competitors or your current competitors are not gonna be your competitors in 10 years. Um, that, that's my opinion. Um, I think we're gonna start seeing Amazon, Google, Microsoft. I saw the Microsoft guy in the back. I had to throw that in there. <laughs> Uh, I think those are going to become our competitors. Um, I think there's going to be significant consolidation in the market. I think they're way too much out there right now um, and too small. And we're going to start seeing a lot of the acquisitions and consolidation, convergence, is, is my opinion. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but whoever's got a mic. <laughs> You talked a lot about um, workflow being king, which is something I agree with. Um, and you also have a very large organization. How do you balance um, standardization in order to scale with workflows that fit the different situations? That, that's an absolutely great question and something we struggle with every single day. It's great to have an amazing and massive organization for some things, but it's not so great for other things. And so what we really try to do is we see ourselves as providing the resources, the infrastructure, the support to that local practice to support that local practice because the workflow in your practice is gonna be different than the workflow in my practice. And we wanna make sure we have the tools to support whatever workflow you and your patients and the staff that you're working with need. Um, we have I two up front <laughs> here too, if we can get mics over here. I had uh, two questions. Uh, the first one was when you started doing telehealth, um, from the beginning, did you look at things like maybe upgrading the bandwidth at the locations that you were at, and then also upgrading the hardware, not just from a, a processing perspective, but even just like having like larger screens to do the telehealth calls, for example. Um, and then the second question was, have you ever had a situation where let's say you have a clinician who's maybe like a rock star in person, but then they go online and you know, for whatever reason, they're just not doing well in telehealth, and maybe you have to have a difficult conversation with them that, you know, this is just not working for telehealth. And, and, and have you done anything to, like, collect patient feedback where maybe if a provider's just not doing well through telehealth, there's actually some feedback from the patient after the, the session? Sure. So um, two parts to that question. I'll attack the first one first and the second one second, which I think makes sense. Um, so the first question is if we upgraded hardware or looked at bandwidth at some of the facilities. So we make all of our physicians have a standard telehealth workstation in their home or office. One of the th things we don't want them to do is be on their smartphone driving trying to deliver telehealth. We don't believe that it's efficient to have them on another shift trying to deliver telehealth. Those of us who have in-person practices, I practice in the emergency department, I can't take care of another patient when I have six to 10 very, very sick patients that I'm trying to take care of. So we have a specific standardized workstation for all of our docs that are delivering telehealth. Now to the question about the bandwidth at the facility. We have a lot of challenges there, same with hardware. What we don't wanna do is set up a massive roadblock to facilities or locations using it. One of the things we liked about VC is their ability to have lower bandwidth necessities, right? So that's one of the things that works out very nicely. Um, we do have challenges. We, we don't sell hardware. We don't push hardware. We can make recommendations to our facilities. We're finding that many of our facilities want to try to repurpose something they already have and use a laptop and a webcam they have. We make some recommendations, but we don't want that to be a $50,000 barrier to entry to getting into telehealth. All right, so that uh, tackles the first question. The second question is, have we found that there are physicians that are in person that are rock stars, and they come over to telemedicine and they're not rock stars, and how do you get that feedback in a timely fashion? So regarding feedback, one of the things that, that VC has built into our platform for us is right after the encounter, depending upon the use case, we get sort of an Uber five-star rating, right? And so if, if the nurse is involved, they're rating the physician. If the patient um, always is rating us, if it's direct to patient, it's only the patient that's rating us. If there's anyone else involved, they provide the five-star rating as well. So we can get that feedback real quick. Quite frankly, we have not had the problem of taking a rock star physician, putting them onto telemedicine, and then not doing a good job. I think, one, I think it's gonna happen. But one of the reasons why we've not had this problem is because we have handpicked these physicians from our 2,000 physicians. So we 
interview, I have a list of 100 docs who want to do this right now, right? We interview how personable. The personable is going to be the key because you have to very quickly develop a rapport with the patient via video. You don't have the time to go back into that room two or three times if you're an emergency medicine doc. It has to be, boom, you got to hit it out of the park right off the beginning. All right, there was a couple more questions. Do we still have time or do we need to? Okay, all right, yeah. So, uh, great presentation, by the way. Thanks. Um, so, given the depth of what you presented, and it's across the entire spectrum of healthcare provision, both inpatient and outpatient, mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned that you know you you you're conducting some studies to look at mm -hmm. how this improves efficiency, generates revenues, intangible cost savings. Are you focusing on any like one area? For me, I'm an anesthesiologist, mm -hmm. and I would immediately think that you clearly are already involved in the perioperative home. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the patient before admission, at admission, post admission, and then you're kind of expanding it now into the post admission home care part of it. And from that perspective, it seems that the possibilities are endless in terms of improving readmission rates, improving intangible savings to the hospital, and then probably improving revenue from the whole spectrum of care. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I, I, what we have found that we do is we build in baby steps. Right? You found a problem you can tackle, you s tackle that problem, you move on to something else. Now as you get all the bricks in a row to build a more comprehensive program, such as a perioperative surgical home, now you have many of the components that you already need. And, and you're absolutely right. I, I think that that's a place that we're going to see healthcare go in. I think that there is some challenges still there around reimbursement models around the perioperative surgical home, but I, I do agree that we have the pieces there to build it. So yes, sir. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. So in the triangle that you had, mm -hmm. you had a physician team, you had operations, mm -hmm. you have uh, business report. Business report. Mm -hmm. But what are you doing to empower the patient? Yeah. So that, that I kicked it off by saying the most important part of that whole thing is putting the patient at the center. So one of the things we're really, really keen on is getting that real-time patient and family experience feedback and understanding how they're enjoying their encounter. So we do that a couple different ways. We talked about the telehealth platform giving us real-time feedback. For our in-person practices, we have something we call EQI, which is electronic quality improvement. And so what we actually do is we take uh, some of the information that would be included in the routine ADT feeds or more advanced ADT feeds from our facilities, and we are able to email and send text messages to the patients immediately after service to get feedback on them. One of the things that we do is we allow it to be customizable. So when we change a process or a workflow, for, for example, let's say that we start a fast track in an emergency department. We can specifically ask them questions related to that experience or a discharge process or maybe a new intake process. We'll put specific questions in there. So that's how we're getting that feedback from this, the patients. I mean, the real problem with healthcare is the chronic care. Mm -hmm. And unless we figure out that engagement part of it, 75% uh, uh, of our healthcare problem is chronic care with diabetes and all. Like yep. uh, patient engagement, say with blood sugars or altering the diet and all that is really important. Yep, absolutely. With all of our in-person acute care practices in the acute care continuum, we see the effects of chronic care all the time. And the complex care management program that I was telling you about is really going to aim at trying to tackle some of those problems. I don't know if I should say this. This is kind of some secret sauce here. So our care coordinator, my team's going to shoot me. Um, I have this theory. I don't know if it's true yet. Um, the engagement with that patient that you bring up is so key. And it's not with the physician and that patient. It's with an individual that that patient can develop a relationship with, that they can understand. So my theory, having lived with my grandmother for a little while, is that we are looking for care coordinators that have lived with a grandparent. And we believe that that actually can predict how good of, how good of care coordinator that they are going to be. I haven't patented that or anything, so <laughs> you guys can feel free to use it. But uh, that's my theory about how we can predict who's going to be best at engaging with that patient. Thank you so much, Rick, for the great presentation.